December 31st, 1943. 52 more weeks of war. 52 more weeks of hell. 52 weeks of places like Kursk, the Kasserin Pass, Shipai Fortress, Salerno, Guadalcanal, Stalingrad, Attu Island, Bougainville. Places that many will never forget. And places that many never left. And now, 1943 has come to its end. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Soviets began new and successful attacks in Ukraine. The Allies also had success on Bougainville Island, and in Italy, they entered Ortona, but did not take it. This week begins with Christmas, and today is New Year's Eve. Martin Gilbert writes, As 1943 came to an end, Germany and Japan could look forward only to further and relentless attacks, both from the unconquered nations ranged against them and from the rising tide of partisan and resistance activity. The United States alone now had 1.6 million servicemen ready to be deployed against Germany and 1.8 million more in action against Japan. Yet both Germany and Japan were determined to fight on, still believing that they could break the power of those United Nations whose armies, navies, and air forces had vowed to fight them until unconditional surrender. Yeah, let's not forget the navies. This week, on the 26th, German battlecruiser Scharnhorst is sunk off North Cape. She is out under Erich Bay hunting convoy JW-55B, but is unaware that the Royal Navy battleship Duke of York is in distant support of that convoy. Scharnhorst and her destroyers don't find the convoy, but they do find its three-cruiser closer covering force. Fighting in poor visibility in the Arctic morning, Scharnhorst loses her forward radar set and breaks off the engagement, circling north to try to find the convoy. At midday in better light, the two sides clash again. You might think the larger German ship would have some advantage, but she again breaks things off. As she withdraws, however, the Duke of York appears and a duel begins. Scharnhorst is wrecked and sinks, and only 36 out of 2,000 crews survive. There are now zero large German surface ships in position to threaten any Arctic convoys. Also at sea this week, in the Bay of Biscay, the German blockade runner Alstelufer is sunk by Allied planes the 27th. On the 28th, two British cruisers meet the 11 destroyers and torpedo boats that were her escort. Three of the German ships are sunk, a pretty impressive achievement against a larger force. In the South Seas, there is a carrier raid against Kaviang on New Ireland. This is two carriers attacking with a dual purpose, to disrupt Japanese traffic from Truk to Rabaul, but perhaps more importantly, to distract from the landings at Cape Gloucester on New Britain. That is Operation Backhander, part of the larger Operation Dexterity, and begins the 26th. This is done by the 1st Marine Division under William Rupertus. After what can only be described as an overwhelming barrage by both naval big guns and B-24 bombers, the men land without incident and expand the beachhead the next day. They soon begin their advance to the Cape Gloucester airfields, which they capture the 30th. Rupertus had risked MacArthur's wrath at the 11th hour by insisting on replanning the assault to eliminate a paratroop drop. It was a change in the plan that saved the whole operation as once again the Japanese defense capability had been underestimated. The Marines found that what were marked as damp flats on their map were actually damp up to your neck. Fighting for three days, through deep swamps in which men were actually killed by sodden branches from rotten trees, the Marines had a tough battle to capture the airstrip. This airstrip brings them yet another leap closer for their aerial assaults on the Japanese base at Rabaul. Meanwhile, across the Vitiaz Strait in New Guinea, the 25th Brigade of George Vesey's Australian 7th Division is heading through the ravines and valleys of the Finisterres to hopefully prevent the withdrawing enemy from ever reaching the garrison at Madang. They begin attacks against Japanese-held Shaggy Ridge now on the 27th with artillery and airstrikes, followed by the men trying to advance up bamboo ladders. The attacks are unsuccessful in taking the ridge. There are successful Allied attacks elsewhere this week, though. In fact, 
In Italy, by the 27th, the Germans, in danger of being flanked by the Canadians, pull out of Ortona. The next day, the Canadians complete the capture of the town. A sign posted at the city limits reads, This is Ortona, a West Canadian town. Now, the Allies, having taken Ortona and Villa Grande, it seems like like perhaps one focused blow against Orsonia would take the main Adriatic strong points of the Germans' Gustav line. But today a blizzard falls over the region, paralyzing movement and communications. Oliver Lees, who took over 8th Army from Bernard Montgomery Christmas Eve, calls off this offensive when he gets the okay to do so from Army Group Commander Harold Alexander. He, Montgomery, had inflicted heavy casualties on the Germans and has siphoned some of their strength away from the West as intended, but he had not made the breakthrough to Peshara and the left wheel towards Rome that General Alexander had hoped for. Yeah, Alexander's plan has really failed. In five weeks, 8th Army has gone barely over 20 kilometers. Peshara is still 16 kilometers to the north, and Rome is beyond the mountains and far, far away. Lees isn't the only person with a new posting. From the 24th to the 27th, there is a series of announcements from London and Washington that make known the leaders for the coming campaigns. Dwight Eisenhower is supreme commander for the Allied invasion of Western Europe, and Air Marshal Arthur Tedder is his deputy. Bertram Ramsey and Trafford Lee Mallory will be in charge of the naval and air forces. Montgomery will now lead the British Army Group involved. Henry Wilson is Supreme Commander of the Mediterranean. Jacob Devers is his deputy. Alexander commands in Italy. Ira Eaker commands the Mediterranean Air Forces. Jim Doolittle will run 8th Air Force. And Carl Spatz will run the U.S. strategic bombing over Germany. Bernard Paget takes over as Supreme Commander, Middle East. I mentioned last week that Winston Churchill has plans for avoiding stalemate in Italy and those involve an amphibious assault at Anzio, southwest of Rome. Churchill tells Alexander to resume the plans, cancelled last week, telling him that without taking advantage of this opportunity, the entire Mediterranean campaign will lead to ruin in 1944. Here's the thing. With all those command changes being made, he can do this. I mean, with Eisenhower leaving the Italian theater and, and Wilson and Alexander in charge, it's all Brits, right? The British chiefs of staff can now run the theater. Knowing well that the Normandy landing scheduled for late spring 1944 would reduce the Italian campaign to a sideshow, Churchill was bent on using what time he had to do something in his favorite theater. And as he raced ahead with his ideas, he found himself in an excellent psychological position. Now that he was ill, would Roosevelt, his old friend, deny him the use of a few LSTs for a few weeks? Well, he asks him, and whether Roosevelt agrees with the goals or out of sympathy as some sources hint at, Roosevelt says, okay, the LSTs, tank landing ships, that are scheduled to go to Britain January 15th will be sent back in February instead. The amphibious operation is going to happen. And today, on New Year's Eve, Montgomery and Eisenhower leave Italy. For all of the issues plaguing the Allies, well, plaguing everyone in Italy that I went over last week, Ike, Eisenhower, does leave thinking he's accomplished his missions. And it's hard to argue. North Africa, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, and a large patch of mainland Italy had been liberated. Fascism has been given its death blow, he wrote, in his final assessment of the Italian campaign. Elimination of Italy from the war had been accomplished. Some two dozen German divisions were tied down in Italy alone, and many more in the Balkans and Greece. The Mediterranean had become an allied pond. Even Stalin had conceded that fighting in Italy seemed to be easing some pressure on the Eastern Front. Though it is the Eastern Front that is the most active one as the year comes to its end. In the south, 19th Tank Corps from Fyodor Tolbukhin's 4th Ukrainian Front attacks on Christmas Day again towards Dniprovka, which fails just like last week's attacks did. Today on New Year's Eve comes another attempt to break into the Nikopol bridgehead, this time at the northern end. But this too fails, and the lines there remain roughly the same. 
Nikopol and its manganese mines remained in German hands, though the bridgehead was increasingly isolated. But the pressure on the Nikopol bridgehead, and perhaps more importantly, the diversion of German forces to deal with the crises to the west of Kiev meant that Hitler's cherished plan to inflict a major defeat upon the Red Army with a thrust to the southeast from Nikopol, which would also restore contact with the German 17th Army in the Crimea, was never put into effect. The major German advances further north against Konstantin Rokossovsky's Belarusian front continue as this week gets going though, but although they have some Soviet units surrounded, many of them break out to the south. They reinforce a new Soviet defensive line and the German attacks end the 27th. This is partly because 16th Panzer Division is withdrawn the 26th to help with the defense of Vitebsk, but will soon be sent down to assist 4th Panzer Army in Ukraine. By Rokossovsky's own admission, this German counterattack has sobered his hopes for reaching and taking Bobruisk, though he plans to try again in the new year. Soviet attacks against Vitebsk, which began last week, continue all this week with new attacks from the West joining the fray as the week begins, but the fighting is inconclusive. It is not inconclusive west of Kiev, however. Nikolai Vatutin's offensive to hopefully reach the Bug River continues. They advance on Christmas Day against an ever more ragged German defense line and take Popilnia the 26th, midway between Zhitomir and Biletserkova. German 4th Panzer Army Commander Erhard Raus has ordered Hermann Balk to counterattack from the north with his forces from near Melanie, but there is a great deal of chaos. All of the German formations are under strength and the deployment of force east and northeast of Zhitomir is complicated by roads choked with retreating German units and civilians fleeing the fighting. By the end of the 26th, it is all they can do to fight off Soviet attacks. They are in no position to attack themselves. And by the end of the 27th, the SS Division Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler has a defensive line 35 kilometers long and has but 41 tanks and assault guns to defend it. This is, of course, inadequate. The 29th, the Soviets retake Korosten. On the 30th, Kazatin falls, and today they take the prize of Zhitomir. This is all a big deal. Kazatin, for example, is the rail junction with lines leading to Kiev, to Poland, and south to Odessa. Vatutin has has broken out along a huge front and has cut the shortest road and rail communications between Army Group South and Germany. And that brings me to the end of the week. With new landings in the South Seas, new leaders all over the Western Allies Armed Forces, Canadian success in Italy, and Churchill driving through his plans. And what might be a big breakthrough in the Soviet Union. If you'll remember, I talked last week about the many millions of men on the Eastern Front on, on both sides. There are a lot of people fighting this war. But look back at 1943 and see the change in character of the war. In 1942, Japan took a massive empire. In 1943, cracks in it grew large. China is a gigantic stalemate. Guadalcanal ended in defeat, and the Allies established themselves in the Solomons and pushed the Japanese back across New Guinea. And the island hopping campaign this year has encroached ever more on Japan's southern perimeter, while attacks against the eastern one have begun taking back territory there. Japan even lost Yamamoto, the architect of Pearl Harbor. More than anything, though, Japan has lost equipment and trained personnel that are irreplaceable. And for all that the Allies have lost in the Pacific, they produce ever more. Japan often cannot even produce at replacement levels at this point. At Stalingrad and in Tunisia, the European Axis lost hundreds of thousands of men they can ill afford to lose. The Mediterranean fell, Sicily fell, the southern half of Italy too. And even though the fight there is now brutal and bloody and nearly at a standstill. It has knocked Italy out of the war, forcing Germany to commit force there that is badly needed elsewhere. Adolf Hitler has hired and fired to assemble the team he wants. So by now, the generals who organized the large-scale field operations of Bewegungskrieg, the classic Prussian and German style of mobile warfare, they're gone. 
In their place are guys like Schoener, Model, and Kesselring. Competent? Sure, sure. But first and foremost, men who stay put and fight when Hitler tells them to. They are not operators. They are standers and, and determined men who consider retreat a personal insult. But you know, the whole point of Bewegungskrieg in the first place was that Prussia was always fighting against superior numbers, and the war of motion and mobility and localized victories was the key to success. Abandoning that and the generals who practice it in the face of superior numbers means having to fight a set-piece war against those superior numbers. And how can that possibly be won? I will end this year of the war with a quote from Robert Satino about those generals, those standers and fighters facing superior numbers. One that serves to remind us what this war actually is about. An army defending itself to the death and bravely resisting the attacks of a superior enemy usually earns our respect. Likewise, every culture in the world holds a special place of reverence for the general leading armies in defense of the homeland. Not this army, however, and not these commanders. We need to write the history of war year 1943 with a complete absence of romance. The Wehrmacht was not defending the fatherland. It was fighting to hold far-flung conquests it had made in a brutal war of aggression, the very definition of ill-gotten gains. Every day that it stayed in the field, every day that Schoener held another series of rigged courts martial against deserters, every day that Model or Kesselring stood fast meant the condemnation of thousands of unfortunates to death. Civilians caught in the immediate crossfire, inhabitants of occupied countries like the Netherlands whom their German masters were deliberately starving to death, slave laborers being worked to death in the Reich's armament factories, and those whom Hitler and his insane racial ideology had identified as existential enemies of the German people, the Jews. Goodbye, 1943.